Thank you so much, Tina and Maria, for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to be part of this, this wonderful, inspiring um, group of people. I had so many ideas after um, yesterday's session that I kind of rewrote big sections of my paper. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. 150 years after the end of indenture in the British Caribbean, its presence lingers in the music of Indians and Guyana, Indo-Guyanese Americans, and the broader labor diaspora. For many diasporic performers, the past is a reminder of indenture's traumas or an embarrassing sight of rural stereotypes. While for others, it is painful for its erasures, for the cultural disruptions wrought by a harrowing journey. For still others, indenture signifies not pain but heritage and pride in hard work. How does one construct shared identities of the indenture diaspora when the past is so fraught and remembered in so many different ways? This paper is about the faintly heard echoes of indenture in Guyana and the Indo-Caribbean diaspora 100 years after the brutal practice was abolished in the British Empire. 53 years ago, Vaith Prakash Vato documented beautiful moving songs of resistance to indenture. But I've found very few direct references to indentureship in Chutney songs and other musical genres performed today. That said, music can serve to obliquely address indenture and negotiate its meanings in the post-indenture period. It's a way to express what Carl Torre Bolle calls the nondi. I came to this project primarily as an ethnographer who listened to stories and songs of Indian Guyanese American Hindu devotional singers who listened um, on and off between 2007 and 2010 and who has indulged a fascination with the internet as a site for transnational indentured diaspora identity formation. My three disparate examples include indentureship slideshows on YouTube, a Chutney Soka song, and Indo-Guyanese American temple performance. In thinking through the ways that memories of indenture resonate through music, I draw on the notion of diasporic intimacy as articulated by Paul Gilroy and George Lipsis uh, in relation to African diasporic musics. And I bring their understandings into dialogue with Michael Hertzfeld's cultural intimacy and Carl Torobole's attitude. <coughs> Building on Gilroy's notion of black Atlantic diasporic intimacy, as the hybrid creativity that emerges through the circulation of music commodities, Lipsitz explores how transatlantic black musical collaborations serve as conduits of socio-political ideas between African and African diasporic people. Tina Ramnarayan and Tejaswini Niranjana have documented similar boarding cross border crossings and alliances between Indian and Indo-Caribbean artists. Through such collaborations, the ruptures of the Kalapani can be aff affectively restored, with the homeland figured not as India, but as um, Torabole's notion of coolitude suggests, as the mixing of the ocean journey itself. In charting the virtual and face-to-face -face conversations about indenture, particularly as they coale coalesce around the painful slur Kuli. I consider the ways that class identity presses on diasporic identity. These conversations often venture into the realm of humor or embarrassment, that is, onto the terrain of what Hertzfeld calls cultural intimacy, or those, quote, those aspects of an officially shared identity that are considered a source of embarrassment, but that nevertheless provide insiders with their assurance of sh shared sociality. I suggest that we can unite Gilroy's and Hertzfeld's helpful tools to think of cultural intimacy in diasporic terms as diasporic cultural intimacy. In the internet age, diasporic cultural intimacies become even more proximate. People from Trinidad, Suriname, Mauritius, Guyana, and North America connect individually, if anonymously, via social media to work through thorny matters of identity and memory. In the first example, I turn to slideshows of Caribbean indebted on YouTube, in which music helps images tell new stories and resound the past. Many of these slideshows were composed to commemorate Indian Arrival Day in Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad. 
These DIY artworks exist on YouTube alongside other Indian Arrival Day videos that include televised documentaries about the history of indenture and home videos of Indian Arrival Day celebrations featuring Bollywood dance or tasa drumming. Slideshow videos of indenture are comprised primarily of black and white images found on the internet and are accompanied by commercial music chosen by the slideshow creator. I'm going to briefly exit um, this in order to um, here. Um, pause it for just a second. This is a, a this is a Mac uh, PC transfer workaround here. Um, in memory of the jihadis by Barry Joel Dasein, a Christian minister and teacher from Trinidad and Tobago, was posted in 2009 and is still available on YouTube, having attracted 28,867 views and 61 comments. It's accompanied by Anil Khan's Hindi studio rendering of the 91st Psalm in a highly produced style. The slow tempo, crooning vocal style, and reverberating vocal and synthesized sounds create a soothing backdrop to troubling images of a colonial past. The slide shows in two parts. Part A consists of indenture and imagery, <coughs> clipper ship exteriors, overcrowded ship interiors, and sugarcane labor. And part B consists of postcard portraits through a colonial gaze in which Indians are depersonalized and categorized as coolie types and lower caste coolies, Port of Spain, Trinidad, among other um, similar um, uh, titles. Music hides the seams between these two parts and with the two sets of images corresponding to the two-part North Indian asthai, or lower refrain, and antara, higher verse form. The indenture images of part A are accompanied by diaphanous synthesized sounds behind a guitar, a santur, a hammer dulcimer, and a western string melody and a vaguely Latin rhythm. A slide reading, united in their culture and traditions, they kept their identity, and another, so today we are grateful for their timeless legacy, coincides at 2 minutes and 33 seconds of an 8 minutes and 30 uh, second film with the beginning of part B, the second verse of the psalm and the antara melody. The images of indenture then constitute a narrative buildup to the main idea being united in their culture and traditions. Indeed, the latter idea is the one that captured the attention of most viewers. So I'll play just a bit from this.
All right. <clears throat> Despite the de text descriptions of hardship and images of Indian people doing uh, grueling labor for white bosses, viewer comments were rarely about the injustices of indenture. In defiance of the colonizer's perspective that marks the original photographs, the YouTube videos <coughs> composed of these photographs uh, or postcards are interpreted by many diasporic viewers as heritage, ancestry, or family, transforming documents of colonial domination into something more akin to family photo albums. Viewers commented with pride in Indian identity and the hard work of indentured ancestors, as well as with a desire for connection across India and its diaspora. The background of many posters was unclear, but those who self-identified were from Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius, Fiji, Suriname, and India. Music guided the affective experience of diasporic listener viewers and helped generate diasporic intimacy while alighting the more painful aspects of these images. Sound, in other words, reconfigured sight. Clear markers of recent studio recording technology, such as <coughs> reverb, close miking, and multi-track recording characterize the musical soundtrack in this and similar videos. But the piece also references India as passives <coughs> through genre, form, instruments, and language. <coughs> Music tells listeners that these faded artifacts from the past are about being Indian in the Caribbean, Caribbean today. They're a timeless legacy, in the words of the slideshow. The next example stays within the orbit, orbit of YouTube, but its only relation to indentureship is the word coolie. This hugely popular Chutney Soka song, Kulibai, became an exuberant identity call for Indo-Guyanese youth. The songwriter and singer is Mystic, a.k.a. Romeo Nirmal, a Port Moron born um, and Georgetown-based rice farmer, reggae singer, and six, since 2015, international Chutney Soka star. The song and related dance craze quickly went viral online and YouTube abounds with videos of boys and men doing the Kulibai dance. Mystic has become so big in Guyana and Trinidad that he headlined a show with the Sp Mighty Sparrow, and he performed sold out shows throughout the East Coast and Midwest during a 2015 um, uh, US tour. <clears throat> Given that the C word continues to evoke the most painful parts of adventure, it may be surprising that this song became the smash hit of 2014-15. As in the previous example, Nirmal's music guides the interpretation of words, but in a distinctly humorous and culturally intimate mode. Kulibai is a Chutney Soka song, or um, what Nirmal likes to call Choka. Um, Chutney Soka brings, to, uh, brings an Indian flavor to Soka music, often by adding Indian percussion like tabla, tolak, or dantal, and by inter introducing Indian themes and Hindi or Bhojpuri words into the lyrics. In this song, Dol Dasa and Sitar add a chutney feel to the synth and drum machine <coughs> rhythm. The chorus consists of repetitions of the lines, Kuli by dance, Kuli by dance, everybody come do the Kuli by dance. And the verses are in the mood of chutney soka bacchanal, with references to whining, liquor, and dance, as well as affirmations of pride in being a Kuli by. The Dol Tassa moves into the foreground during a break in which Mystic drops into the lower part of his register to sing nostalgically of traditional East Indian life. Um, and I, I, I probably won't be able to start in the middle as I plan, but we'll listen to where, whatever this is. Yeah, mom. Hmm. Me just realized me's a bully boy. Me ever seen some sound like a bully boy. Some school, some bun like a bully boy. When I beat some like a bully boy. Me never wait for no man like a bully boy. Like eating man, me's a bully boy. Me like to get hit, me's a bully boy. Books are rare, me's a bully boy. School, some bun, me's a bully boy. Me never shame, me's a bully boy. Singing Mendoza, Mr. Cooling Boy. Everyone, Mr. Cooling Boy, dance 
As of September 29th, 2017, uh, the video had 3,145,416 views, with 8,000 thumbs up, 1,000 thumbs down, and 687 <laughs> comments. You can add your own thumbs up and thumbs down after, uh, after this talk. Most of the comments, around 308, evince general enthusiasm. As in Cookie Biome's tune is wicked, dance is simple and neat. The second most common category um, of comment expresses Guyanese national sentiment, as in Ashley's big up Guyana, who's agree. The third most common type of comment expressed pride in Indian indentured diaspora identity using the language of the song. Angel wrote, quote, good, good work, proud to say uh, me one coolie woman, love this song, keep them coming, mystic. Yet another group of commenters noted particular lines about Indo-Guyanese life that they found humorous or familiar, such as Miss Gruesome Bulb, a reference to an Indian style of dancing with one hand in the air. And the, the dance that circulates, this is one of the gestures in the dance. Um, None of these comments elicited much controversy, but any declaration of opinion regarding the C word was hotly debated. Commenters were crit who criticized the use of the word did so on the grounds that A, it should not be uttered if anyone finds it offensive, and B, that one should not, pro proudly, uh, should not proudly proclaim a colonial moniker of subjugation. On a different website about indenture, a poster expressed the latter sentiment particularly powerfully. The word coolie was created by the white man to degrade the Indians in that time and place. Indians, be proud of our accomplishments and what we are today, and please don't allow the white massa to label us. To this, someone re responded pithily, so I guess you don't like the song Coolie by dance. Um, back at the YouTube post of Kulibai, Mystic's fans use several arguments to defend his use of the C word. Here are just a few of them. The last of these arguments is one that I read on several comments threads on other sites and indeed resonates with the discourse surrounding um, indenture videos. On one of these sites, a poster wrote eloquently, um, quote, considering the word coolie to be derogatory is demeaning to our ancestors who were laborers and porters to survive um, uh, uh, under harsh circumstances and is also demeaning to contemporary laborers and porters. I am a proud coolie. Though one of the arguments for use of the term is that meanings change, I argue that one reason it has reemerged as a key identity term is that it continues to evoke indenture, even if faintly, in ways that cry out for healing and reimagination. The C word appears only very rarely in Chutney songs, and usually only in songs that describe the harmful words of white bosses. I believe that Mystic gets away with it in part by humorously invoking markers of Indian identity that could be taken as offensively stereotyped if not sung by an Indian Guyanese farmer. Combined with an exuberant dance, it's a note of transnational coolitude intimacy and a not uncontroversial way to carve a space for working class people within the indentured diaspora. Its discourses reveal that memories of indenture particularizes the pain of servitude or generalized as pride and hard work are never far from the ter term's imaginaries. One final example. Um, the final example takes us to the intimacy of face-to-face -face temple performance in two Indo-Caribbean temples in Minneapolis. But for the most part, the songs and chants of Hindu temples do not refer explicitly or implicitly to indenture. What did emerge in my research, though, was a deep ambivalence about the Indo-Caribbean rural past, which endured in the ethics and aesthetics of sound. For some professional and upwardly mobile people, rural Guyanese cultural practices existed at the intersection of embarrassment and pride that characterized cultural intimacy. I found two competing aesthetics and vocal style, or air as it was referred to my, uh, to by my interlocutor, uh, interlocutors, what they called filmy air and what I call pochbui air. The tension between these two airs most often emerged during moments of solo pajin singing that peppered the service. 
In some cases, the singer would sing a bhajan from a Bollywood film, imitating the form and vocal stylings of a recording. But in other cases, she would sing a bhajan from the oral tradition in the timbre and style of Bhojpuri folk music as, maintain, as it's maintained in rural Guyana over the generations of indenture. The priest and temple president inclusively invited people to sing, but when tensions arose, an ethical discourse emerged that revealed class conflicts belied by this performative egalitarianism. In aesthetic terms, the filmy air was described as sweet by its professional proponents, while the Pochpuri air was described as unpolished and rough. Similarly, film budgets were described as authentic because they came directly from India, rather than having been transformed linguistically and musically over time in the Caribbean. So I'll just briefly um, play Probably can't hear that very well. <laughs> Alright, I'll stop it since you can't hear it anyway. Um, let's see. And then here is Anjali singing in a filmy style. <laughs> From the vantage of Minneapolis, remembering indenture is not only a journey into the past, but also to another country. In this space apart, one can choose to inhabit those memories, or one can choose an ancestral home in India, apart from Guyana and its painful past of indenture and association with rural stereotypes. And in conclusion, in these three very different examples, we see how singers and audiences remake the past in the present, transforming colonial subjugation into hard work and heritage, robbing stereotypes of their power, and looking to India when Caribbean past proved too, too embarrassing or painful. The indenture experience becomes a focus for the stories and identities of people across the labor diaspora, and music becomes a conduit of diasporic cultural intimacies, made all the more intimate through social media. Thank you. And thank you so much to the organizer for, for uh, doing such an amazing job at the conference, Tina, for inviting me. Um, and I'll start my talk. Um, I want to sort of preface um, my presentation by saying that um, I'm an Indian, so I have a very kind of indoctrinated sense of Gandhi. And what I'm presenting on today is how I had to relearn him um, through the lens of indenture. So <clears throat> just to sort of um, give you that kind of preface. Um, though the end of indenture in 1917 is typically viewed as a byproduct of India's struggle for self-government, this presentation reimagines the inverse in which indenture resistance in the diaspora is viewed as the indispensable catalyst in the mainland's decolonization and independence. <coughs> I indulge in thinking through the possibilities of re-territorializing Gandhian history and activism as a legacy of indenture history thus overturning the dominant narrative in which the institutionalized efforts to stylize India before Gandhi are set aside to imagine Gandhi <coughs> before India. Reading Gandhi as a product of diaspora is to arrive at a new appreciation of how the traditional hierarchy between center and periphery, or diaspora and mainland, are enigmatically inverted in the production of what Walcott describes as the sound of history really beginning. Not as echo but origin, diaspora in this view enacts not only the dispersal, but rather implosion <coughs> sorry, of the continuum of history to uncover radical new pedagogies that become available through history's reinterpretation from below, and which reveal neo-colonizing agendas to control the re-memoring of the past. Next step is going through a problem too. V.S. Naipaul perhaps alludes to this in his memoir on writing Finding the Center where he says that it was only in Gandhi's autobiography, thank you, it was only in Gandhi's autobiography in the chapters dealing with the tremendous discovery in the 1890s of the wretchedness of the unprotected, unprotected Indian laborers in South Africa that I found obliquely and not for long a rawness of hurt that was like my own in India, 
So he's writing about his uh, travel narratives. He recounts his reaction to the eclipsing of the greater good of his indenture ancestors through the projection of two Indias, the stylish Indian <coughs> of Nehru and Tagore versus the personal hidden one of his village ancestors, which vanished <coughs> when the memories faded. As a type of reading in the vein of what Francoise Lyonnais calls thinking through the minor or minor transnationalisms, diaspora as foundational pedagogy is as well important for Indians like myself, um, so-called tribal people who are not even in the caste system, uh, who can begin to participate in the exercise of imagining India today, or Indianness today, I'm sorry. <coughs> Narratives that continue to focus on Gandhi's arrival and return to India from South Africa forget by extension the shaping role South African indentured groups had on him, and whose influence, however paradoxically, remains as an, as an enigma in Gandhi's appropriation of peasant clothing <coughs> to further his message of material poverty as so forth. <coughs> the erasure of Gandhi's convoluted, at times unsettling, and contradictory political evolution his many avatars, not simply the one, is here assessed through the controlled optics in representations <coughs> of Gandhi's politics of embodied resistance, known more famously as Satyagraha, meaning truth force, his signature passive nonviolent resistance movement, first conceptualized and practiced in South Africa. Specifically, this close reading of both personal and archival images um, so the images will be really um, uh, uh, different. Some are taken by me. I'm not a good photographer. Um, some are taken by my husband, who is a professional photographer. And some I have just stolen from the internet. So they're going to be all kinds. Um, so we just have to bear with it. But um, it's um, images taken of Gandhian institutions in New Delhi and Johannesburg in South Africa and offers a reading against the unidimensional representation of Gandhi's activism that obscure and include his foundational years in the Transvaal and Natal, in particular his complicated involvement with the indentured. <clears throat> Selective stylization, spectacle, and dress were critical, not accidental, to Gandhi's promotion of Satyagraha as passive resistance. And this element of branding continues to be seen in the institutionalization of a single narrative of post-colonial independence that strategically omits his omits his deeply problematic relations with and view of both indentured Indians and native South Africans. It's a la it will be a lasting irony <coughs> that Gandhi's final appropriation of the loincloth and open-toed sandals has made him a global symbol of nonviolent resistance that may forever forget his attempts to demean actual workers and farmers and native Africans to win favor for elite professional Indians. <clears throat> the erasure of Gandhi's complexity and contradictoriness, uh, which I think are his humanness, has been particularly successful by training the eye of new generations, <clears throat> particularly so in India, to find significance in the mainland as the beginning of Gandhi's real political activism, and the South Africa years as parenthetical and thus insignificant. Um, <clears throat> so this is something I, I, I did because my students know Gandhi in this way. <coughs> so if you just Google Gandhi's image into the internet, <coughs> which is a huge source of controlled optics, um, um, you'll only find one image or two images of um, uh, any uh, only two images don't give, that give you a different sense of what Gandhi looked like um, before he looked like this. Anyone who grew up with Indian parents who lived through the independence years could not not know the peculiar greatness of Gandhi. <clears throat> Everyone speaks about his special diets, his um, practices of celibacy, his ascetism, his spirituality, but also as the architect of Indian, inden uh, Indian independence. I'm sorry. And he achieved it looking like this. Without irony or confusion, from a young age, this kind of image of Gandhi is central to how Indians are indoctrinated in the peculiar modernity of in independent India. 
specifically its non-Machiavellian quality in which the means had to justify the ends. <clears throat> in New Delhi today, several Gandhi institutions present a carefully crafted and stylized narrative of India's post-colonial post -colonial continuity and inevitability. And this is done speci specifically by presenting Gandhi and Satyagraha, in particular the famous salt march in Gandhi, Ahmedabad, by occluding its origins and relation to indenture resistance in apartheid South Africa. The National Gandhi Museum in New Delhi is one of the few places where you can find anything on the diasporic Gandhi, um, that is the South African Gandhi. When you walk up to the building, and I lost this image, I'm sorry, I don't have it for you. <coughs> when you walk up to the building, which was founded in 1961, um, you're struck by its simplicity against rising Delhi. So you have modern Delhi with all the modern buildings and a building that has remained unchanged since 1961. You'll just have to believe me because I don't have any. <laughs> um, when, when you enter the building or you sit in the archives, um, you're overwhelmed by the smell of phenyl and anyone who's been to India knows what phenyl is for um, to clean the open toilets. Um, so that's an indication of um, not it's it's kind of um, it's kind of abandonedness. Um, when you walk into the ground floor, on the right hand side, there's an annex. Sorry, this images. <coughs> there's an annex of Gandhian images and paper mache figures um, that reenact Gandhi South Africa figures. Um, so they're not in the order that I have them here. So I'm just going to click <coughs> and sort of read through. Um, this is an image of which was made famous, obviously, in the movie by Attenborough Gandhi, where he's thrown off the train. They're really tiny, actually, like this big. Um, this is another spectacle where he would actually go into court and refuse to uh, have a lawyer, being a lawyer himself, and asking for the highest number of years for imprisonment. Um, oh, you can't even see it. Okay. It's because of the lighting, I'm sorry. It's, um, he's basically in court, um, and there's indentured people who are following him because he um, encourages everyone to get imprisoned. This is the famous, um, his return to India from South Africa. Um, this is the first time Gandhi wears this kind of dress. Um, it was a big event at the time, obviously. Um, this is a replica of the first Satyagraha ashram in South Africa. So they did it exactly as it was in South Africa. This is his room. You can't go into it, but you can see it from outside. Oh, so, and these are the um, pictures of the uh, settlements, Phoenix Settlement and Tolstoy Settlement. You can't really see them, I'm sorry. It's just to give you an idea of the feel of the place, actually. These are the original, uh, this is the original image of what who are called the first pioneers at Phoenix Farm. I couldn't find Gandhi, but it's someone's wedding at the farm. <clears throat> These are his, as Tina and I spoke about, oh, that's, can I just show you the, uh, it's quite interesting. Can you see it now? Yes. <laughs> Um, so this is really interesting because um, the one time that he did lead the indentured workers on a protest was by sitting on the border um, to protest the, the taxation for their mobility. Um, so it's interesting that he put, uh, they put, him, put them in the court like this, but I guess it's okay. Um, um, as he and I were speaking about, much is made of, as it says here, Gandhi's worldly possessions. Much is made of the fact that he had very few of these, right? Not that he had a lot of them. Um, he always, until his death, he had the hear no evil, <coughs> see no evil, <coughs> speak no evil. Um, and his, as his grandson has said, this is the only Western um, possession that he kept, um, even as he abandoned all the Western things. And the spectacles, I don't know if they're considered Western. <coughs> so just outside, the, um, this enshrining of a very kind of otherworldly um, <coughs> pantomime sense of Gandhi's South Africa years, we have this uh, newly made sculpture of the Dandi March in India um, in surrealist style. And that's made much of in the plaque, which uh, I forgot to photograph at the bottom, sorry. But 
Um, the point is that the, the ashram from his South Africa years are juxtaposed with the Gandhi march, which is in India. So one of the things that I'm trying to speak about is how these two forms of Gandhi's Indian, uh, sorry, encounter with different Indian identities are constantly juxtaposed um, and confused. <coughs> In the eternal Gandhi Multimedia Museum, which continues this trendification of Gandhi, as I'm trying to suggest, um, the website says that the museum will offer an experiential journey and step-by-step -step portal into India's coming of age as an independent nation. According to the website, the eternal Gandhi M Multimedia Museum is the world's first digital multimedia museum, which won a coveted New York City Design Award. And the website is liberally peppered with catchwords like modern design, technology, <coughs> interface actions, to suggest that the museum does not, quote, merely scan Gandhian images. Rather, we interpret Gandhian vision in newer product design. The visionary has gone, but his dream may be unfulfilled. In this void, we do not merely copy old forms and hold them sacred, nor capture photorealistic images of Gandhi frozen in time, <coughs> which is done in the South Africa years. We rather extrapolate Gandhian ideals into newer domains of interest, information technology and product design. <coughs> Against the backdrop of globalization, the eternal Gandhi encompasses new boundaries to illustrate the universal identification by all with the Gandhian ethos. So in the multimedia museum, this is one of my very badly taken images, um, it's an interactive museum. Um, so this is um, Gandhi done kind of like I think in the Hitchcock style. <coughs> Anyone seen the Hitchcock movie? Um, if you approach this and you wave your hand like this, um, the sound of Sare Jaha Se Acha, which means uh, India is the greatest place in the world or something, um, by the Urdu poet Muhammad Iqbal will start playing. <clears throat> so the whole thing is to, you know, interact with Gandhi in some way. Um, this is the chakra, um, which is, uh, actually the picture doesn't capture the way in which there are hundreds of them, um, but obviously made to seem more appealing and not sort of um, <clears throat> this idea of ascetism. This is the other train, oops, sorry. Um, this is the train which he uh, took, um, not the single train that he took, but it emblematizes his um, journey across uh, rural India in third class. Um, that's what the plaque says. <clears throat> um, and I just want to briefly mention that the two, two train images, one made of paper mache, the one where he's th thrown off Pretoria, mm -hmm. um, and this one, which is an imitation of life, so it's a real size of train. Um, they capture the contradictory diasporic Gandhi that I'm trying to allude to. <clears throat> the first one, in which he fights to be allowed into the first class for being neither coolie nor kafir, um, those are his words. The second, in which he self-consciously and famously travels by third class in order to meet the real <coughs> India. And the plaque here explains that Gandhi sets about rediscovering India after his sojourn in South Africa, as if those were his uh, vacation time. Mm -hmm. 2017, in addition to being the 100th year of indentures end, is also, it's also the 70th year of Indian independence. And I've never heard of any country celebrating 70 years of anything, but India has. <laughs> I think it's one of Modi's madnesses. Um, but, um, and so we can take as exemplary this uh, continuation of this kind of branding, branding of Gandhi um, by this new installation that, was, that took over 10 years, which is why it's not Modi, because he hasn't been in power for 10 years. <coughs> it took over 10 years, sorry, this is a prison cell, um, uh, but the prison cells that he was in in India, and it's surrounded by acoustics of uh, prison noises and also writings that he wrote uh, while he was in prison. Um, so this would be on the, that would be on the top floor of the Birla uh, Museum. <clears throat> and on the bottom floor, again, you have, without any irony or contradiction, um, this image of Gandhi's few possessions, because that's also where he spent his last days at the bottom. So this is enshrined. And again, his room where he spent. 
So you can again see the, the monkeys. Um, so this is the new project I'm speaking about, which was uh, has been commissioned for over 10 years. I wasn't able to go see it uh, because it hadn't opened when I was in India. Um, it cost um, 200 crore Indian rupees, which is 32 million um, US dollars, um, over 10 years. Um, and it continu continues the trendification of Gandhi and the specious branding of India's tra transition from colonial to post-colonial as a neat and linear tra trajectory. It's advertised through Tumblr as when 3D printing became a part of the iconic Dandi, <coughs> Dandi being the famous salt march. And the objective was to give shape and form to the unknown participants of the salt march. The products aimed to couple, these are the products that uh, you can again sort of interact with. The products aim to couple Gandhian discourse of ascetism with indigenous technology. That's a new term that they're using. Um, to suggest Gandhi's renewed relevance to India's environmental future. <clears throat> so that is the solar tree. Um, they have solar light operated salt making pans. Um, there's a bamboo studio, which I wasn't able to get an image of. Oh, this is the, um, so you can actually uh, walk up. They're actually larger than life. And they're trying to give you know, a face to the <clears throat> thousands of people that marched with him. So this is the, um, I guess, the, the cream on top of this exhibition. And the uh, caption reads, stylized hands raised up in the sky, holding at the top a simulated salt crystal to form the canopy. Um, if anyone knows what that means. <laughs> um, emphasis throughout the website and when you actually go into this project um, is placed on viewers and the audience having a participatory relationship, and that's a quote from the website, so that one actually feels as if they are in the march and again with Gandhi. Uh, my sister actually went to design school in Ahmedabad. Um, and she was able to get for me these images. Uh, one of her friends was uh, commissioned to be one of the sculptors. I just wanted to show you that <clears throat> a lot of work was put into it. Uh, and you can see that it's kind of like a warehouse. So there's a lot of statues. As one historian notes, it was really Gandhi's return to India in 1915 as a complete stranger that caused the plight of Indians overseas to rouse a global awareness. The, com <clears throat> the complete stranger being referred to, of course, is Gandhi's choice to completely abandon westernized dress for the first time after his final departure from South Africa. His arrival and return to India glorified in the Indian cultural canon as seen here in the stamps. So there were these stamps made for um, <clears throat> 100 years after he returned. That would have been 2015. These two stamps. Uh, so what I'm just trying to say is that it's all about his coming back to India. And whereas in South Africa, it was like a vacation, as we've seen before. <clears throat> um, his arrival and return, however, never framed as strange, or rarely framed as strange, um, but conveniently absorbed into his discourse of ascetism and later his advocation for the burning of foreign goods <coughs> and highly spectacular actions in the Swadeshi movement, Swadeshi meaning of one's country evoking the scriptural taboo of the Kalapani within the Swadeshi context, inadvertently or not, promoted the idea that local and, ind local and indigenous was critical to the cleansing of the soul of India. Though of course, as an upper caste person of means, Gandhi was himself several times able to cleanse himself ritually, because he had the money to do so, of his own voyages overseas, first to London and several trips to South Africa. Am I going over time? Okay. Um, Gandhi arrived in South Africa in 1893 at the age of 24. He lived there for 20 years and returned to India in 1914 at the age of 45. And he was assassinated 34 years later in 1948. In his 21 years in South Africa, Gandhi accomplished many legal victories for Indian South Africans most famously the three pound tax on post-indenture Indians, the Asiatic Regist Registration Act, 
that prohibited the movement of Indian men over the age of eight um, at, after 9 p.m. Um, legislation that prohibited Indians from owning property, buying property or land, and a law that refused to recognize marriage between Hindu and Muslim Indians. <clears throat> and that is something actually his wife um, fought for. A close reading of one, one of Gandhi's few writings to raise global awareness on the plight of overseas Indians, however, illustrates the same confusion of disparate Indian identities, and which has become normalized even in contemporary cultural and literal, literary studies <coughs> that refuse to acknowledge distinctions between Indian diasporas. As we will see, Gandhi shifts between referring to forms of abuse against all South Asian Indians and to offering distinctions between lower caste and yes, yeah, between the lower caste and merchant trader or professional Indians to favor the latter group. In particular, the rights of the upper caste professionals to be granted full membership within empire is set against what he views as the justifiable cultural colonization of Indian farmers and half-human natives. <coughs> Whenever I'm using those derogatory terms, I'm always quoting. I'm just to let you know. Um, such discourse underscores the entirety of his 1896 publication, The Green Pamphlet, subtitled The Grievances of the British Indians in South Africa, an Appeal to the Indian Public. <clears throat> For me, this, is a, this exemplifies the convenient way in which the word Indian serves as a sliding term that sometimes refers to all overseas Indians, and other times a reified term in which merchants and traders are presented as more valuable Indians <clears throat> than the indentured. Impressively, Gandhi is explicit in asserting that what unfolds in South Africa will have ramifications um, throughout the colonies. The Indian government and the Indians themselves believe that it is in South Africa that this question of their status must be determined. If they secure the position of British subjects in South Africa, it will almost be impossible to deny it to them elsewhere. If they fail to secure that position in South Africa, it will be extremely difficult for them to attain it elsewhere. Thus, then, the decision of the question will affect not only the Indians at present settled in South Africa, but the whole future generations of Indians, and also the position of Indian immigrants in other parts of Her Majesty's dominions and allied states. <clears throat> While outwardly speaking for all Indians in South Africa, and at many times including data in support of the abusive conditions against indenture and post-indenture Indians, Gandhi is also clear in making the following distinctions. <clears throat> One constant uh, theme in his, nar in his text, I'm sorry, is that he should be pardoned for speaking up for a body of respectable, hard-working men whose position is so misunderstood that their very nationality is overlooked. And a name labeled to them which tends to place them on an exceedingly low level in the estimation of their fellow creatures. <clears throat> Thus, the quiet and altogether inoffensive Arab shopkeeper and the equally harmless Indian merchant are wrongly lumped together with the laborers and workers. And I'm quoting, when one reflects that the conception of Brahminism, with its poetic and mysterious mythology, comes from the same land as the divine Buddha, it is regretful that the children of such a race should be treated as the equals of the children of black heathendom and outer darkness. <clears throat> I suppose he means Africa by outer darkness. The traders are in fact scholars and gentlemen more sensitive and poetic in nature than is required in the highest schools of Oxford and Cambridge. And it is the sons of this land of light who are despised as coolies and treated as kafirs. <coughs> Brahminism, it must be noted, is the root cause of the continued subjugation of the indigenous Dalits in India, who Gandhi himself called Harijans, children of God, and a term the community continues to fight to break free from. The pamphlet also announces Gandhi's success <coughs> in changing legis legislation for public toilets. The Indian, when put on the same level as the native, has to endure the indignity of sharing toilets marked natives and Asiatics. We, meaning Gandhi, <coughs> petitioned the authorities to do away with the invidious distinction, and they have now provided three separate entrances for natives, Asiatics, and Europeans. The toilet, again, 
was another site of Gandhi's spectacular sights of embodied resistance. In his insistence that the cleaning of the toilet, a task usually reserved for the lowest caste, <clears throat> was each person's moral and spiritual obligation. If you've seen Attenborough's movie, there's a huge scene where he forces his wife um, to clean the toilet when she refuses. <clears throat> Gandhi is also at pains to recognize that the authorities, that is, apartheid police, may understandably not be able to distinguish between an indentured Indian and a free Indian, especially at night, uh, which was in any case forbidden. He, he says, we, on the other hand, submit that nothing could be easier. The indentured Indian never is dressed in a fashionable dress. The presumption should be in favor of, not against, not against the Indian, especially an Indian of the type I am referring to. In a long personal anecdote invoking a Muslim Indian trader friend, <coughs> Gandhi explains how the police must take care to note the distinguishing mark between a trader and laborer, the flowing rogue, so that there must be a tacit understanding between the police and the public that those wearing the flowing robe should not be arrested, even if they come out after 9 p.m. <coughs> On the specific issue of the repatriation of the indentured person, specifically, Gandhi suggests that the twice enforced migration of laborers, <clears throat> first through indenture, first through indenture, and then through repatriation, was an insult to workers who turned out to be trustworthy and useful domestic servants. As he says, a man is brought here in theory with his own consent in practice very often without. He gives the best five years of his life, he forms new ties, forgets old ones, <clears throat> establishes a home here, and he cannot, according to my view of right and wrong, be sent back. Interestingly, of course, Gandhi asserts that the indentured person in five years forgets India, when in his own 21 years and more absence from India, this does not remove him, excuse me, this does not move him to question his own right to return. <clears throat> he goes on to say that better by far to stop the further introduction of Indians altogether than to take what work you can out of them and order them away. This last sentence, which is actually advocating for the end of the indenture system, will be the fragment from a larger narrative for which he will be remembered as the champion of the end of indenture. <clears throat> Gandhi's memorialization in the Johannesburg jail. Oh, I just wanted to show you this because Johannesburg uh, jail is full of art, if you ever get a chance. Oh, this is an example. Which the prisoners themselves make, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, just included that for fun. <coughs> so this is the, in front of the uh, cell that is now um, a Gandhi memorial site. Um, so it has this just here. Just want to show you a few images. I'm um, going to try to show you, um, so this is his cell and it has these beautiful silk sheets that have narratives of his history. Um, this again, the sandals. Um, so I, what I find very interesting, what I meant by his humanness, which gets occluded, um, is these things where Gandhi himself is trying to speak of the importance of South Africa, <coughs> which institutions are for whatever reason erasing. Um, as it says here, truly speaking, it was after I went to South Africa that I became what I am now. My love for South Africa and my concern for her problems are no less than for Indians. <clears throat> and this is a section where someone says, ironically, it was within this radically divided metropolis that Gandhi was able to develop his humanist values, which embraced all fellow Indians regardless of their religion or caste. Um, so what I'm trying to just suggest is that these ironies, these paradoxes and contradictions um, are, not in, are not included in the way that we um, think about um, Gandhi. <clears throat> these are the larger-than-life uh, larger footsteps, um, last footsteps that he took. These are in India before he was assassinated. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Um, I'm actually about to finish. Sorry about that. Um, The complete erasure of indenture's importance, particularly in its relevance to Satyagraha, will of course never be successful because of Gandhi's own flowing robes of another kind. 
specifically in the case of seeing Gandhi as a product of the indenture resistance in diaspora, rather than only as the producer of India's post-coloniality, what are the epiphanies to be gleaned in maintaining the contradiction of a man who went from being an enthusiastic stretcher bearer of empire during the Boer War to the great soul Mahatma of anti-colonial struggle? Using the latest technology to design Gandhi without the contradictions and complexities of, of the South Africa years uses the disorientation of the placelessness of cognitive mapping to further a neo-colonizing agenda in the making of a future without a past. But as diasporic, and by recentering Gandhian anti-colonial discourse and Indian post-coloniality <coughs> within Indenture's frame, Gandhian spect <coughs> spectacle can be perceived as a humanizing pedagogy of cultural recovery. History really beginning then is not simply about how it was, but an exercise in chronicling every moment of danger, <coughs> as Benjamin says, so that no small or great event is lost, and only for a resurrected humanity would its past in all of its moments be citable. Indenture resistance and diaspora, as this history really beginning, may as well begin to democratize the meaning of indigenous transactionary. Sorry, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some ideas that I'm working through right now and um, share the kinds of theoretical terrain that I'm both engaging with and trying to create. So just some really basic definitions, if you could call it that. What do I mean by jihadian negotiations? Um, there are many things I could say on this, but very briefly, drawing from Joy Mahabia, who uh, points to Indian women's plantation economy tradition of labor, labor resistance, and liberation, right? Um, and uh, in essence, what are the kinds of uh, negotiations with various forms of um, control and exploitation and violence that Indian women have been, um, with which Indian women have been engaging as part of the indentureship experience? And what do I mean by matrilineal genealogies? Uh, for me, it's important, I'm going to be talking about Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship. It's important to see how Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship has been drawing on a history of challenges and resistance and uh, searches for self-determination and autonomy that have characterized Indian women's indentureship experience. So, for example, Patricia Mohammed talks about gender negotiations in the, um, in the early 20th century. Um, and uh, really, I would argue myself, if I had to give them a temporal um, organization, that you're getting this, you can see gender negotiations uh, beginning to emerge even in Indo-Caribbean women's public articulations and writings from the 1930s up until the 1950s. Um, secondly, this idea of matril matrilineal genealogies moves from the 1960s to the 1990s, so uh, education begins to be introduced in the 1940s and 1950s, and I argue, based on the anthropological work in Trinidad, um, early work of Morton Class, um, uh, Smith and, uh, and the Nihoffs, that uh, by the 1950s, Indian women had begun to uh, renegotiate the expectations of marriage and childbirth. You see, you begin to see rising <coughs> ages of marriage in this second period, and you begin to see the idea of personal choice and individual self-fulfillment emerging in these negotiations. And what happens is you move from gender negotiations, that is, negotiations that are happening but that are not so legitimate to actually an idea that a legitimate part of your trajectory as an Indian woman is to define your path for yourself in between the expectations of marriage, family, children, as well as career, uh, education, and uh, um, political involvement. And I'm arguing that the matrilineal genealogy, like in us tracing Indian women's uh, transgressions and 
uh, resistances, collusions and accommodations also, but in essence, search for autonomy and self-determination. We're at a period that we're calling feminist navigations now. This is a post-1990s characterized by research conducted at the turn of the century that basically argues that if you're looking at a generation of Indo-Caribbean feminist thought and engagement, you're looking at navigations that are informed indelibly by feminism, second wave feminism, and that which now are engaging in these gender negotiations in the context of the impact that feminism has had on them. But I do wanna really challenge, sitting where I, I do at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies in the Caribbean, I really wanna challenge the idea that feminisms are important to the Caribbean and really highlight the idea that feminisms are um, emerging from the experiences that women and men have had over the um, period of colonization and uh, indentureship. Now, before I go into talking the third part of my presentation, so jihadian negotiations, matrilineal genealogies, what are they? And before I go into discussing where my mind is currently, which is working through what is this thing called post-indentureship feminist thought, and um, um, and how can we create these concepts out of our own experience that we can then use theoretically. Uh, a couple of things I want to say about Indo-Caribbean feminist thought. Now, Indo-Caribbean feminist thought, for me, is an intellectual, um, is an intellectual genealogy. There's been more than 30 years of Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship, as well as other forms of um, writing and engagement, and yet it's largely left out in the historiographies of intellectual thought in both the Caribbean and in the Indian diaspora. So it sits at the nexus of the two, but is considered, but is largely treated as marginal to both. Um, and so my work has really been to trace Indo-Caribbean intellectual trajectories and genealogies and to insist on their centeredness in particular ways. Um, and so in this, I'm myself not doing new work, I am building, I think, on a legacy of scholarship that has been created over the last 30 years and coming to think about what are its implications now. For those of us in the Caribbean that don't wish to treat the Caribbean as a source of data but not a source of theory, and instead to treat the Caribbean as a place in which we come up to, with the concepts and the theories that uh, um, emerge from our own experience. Now, um, as I move on, I want to say something very interesting, which is about the work that I've been doing in Indo-Caribbean feminist thought um, and a collection that just came out. And what's really interesting in it is that in, in all the pieces in the collection, and we didn't organize it this way, neither India past or present was a point of reference. This is something we observed at the end of the collection when we were like, this is really interesting. What's going on here that none of these, none of these authors in this collection, their 18 essays, um, are looking to India to define Indianness in the Caribbean. And for, this, this, for me, this was really significant, whether it's generational, I don't know what explains it, I think perhaps generation, but I think also the fact that, um, that there are these matrilineal genealogies of jihadian negotiations and 30 years of Indo-Caribbean feminist thought in which to draw on, right? In other words, we are creating our own terrain um, to, as a basis for homegrown feminist theorizing, and I use homegrown here deliberately as opposed to indigenous feminist theorizing, drawing from Shona Jackson's work about, um, about the uses of indi indigenousness, indigeneity in the Caribbean. Now, in this, Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship and theorizing that has been created over the past 30 years, a theoretical terrain has been created out of the experiences of women's lives. And I personally find this super exciting because you've taken the words that have, um, that have touched people intimately in various ways and then begun to creatively uh, work them uh, to create a uh, conceptual terms, in other words, to create a conceptual terrain of, from words like matakor, bindi, aji, jahaji, um, bimpauji, and so on. The work of Andil Gosain to work the cutlass, um, and um, Joy Mahavir writing about jewelry um, and bearers. And I'm calling it here the afterlife of indentureship because I was quite inspired by a recent essay of uh, Nalini Mohaber. 
um, and a generation of Indo-Caribbean scholars that is uh, uh, currently looking at what what uh, Anne Ilko signed in a recent small acts issue called the afterlife of indenture. And so I find Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship at this moment really defines this afterlife of indenture by creating a conceptual terrain that is available for us to, um, to manipulate, to use, and to use creatively, you know, to, to create, basically, um, for ourselves. This conceptual terrain is visual, also embodied, and also oral. Now, this collection, Indo-Caribbean Feminist Thought, came out in November, I think last year, or the year before, and uh, really defined where my head was at um, at the time. I thought I was pulling from 40 years of Indo-Caribbean Feminist Scholarship, highlighting how the very concepts that came out of women's lives were ones that we were using conceptually, we were doing theory making that was homegrown from the ground up, and uh, drawing on mat matrilineal um, traditions and experiences. I've now moved on from this, uh, and um, this is, um, I've decided I'm not interested in this anymore. And, um, <laughs> and so really I'm trying to work out where is my head actually at having, because as soon as it happened, I was like, you know, this isn't it, um, somehow. But let me describe what's going on here first, before I get to why I'm thinking about post-indentureship feminist thought now. So first of all, the, this conceptual terrain that I've just shown here, um, which we document in the book, is what Ramabai Espany describes as a female epistemology of Cain, which unearths and resurrects the silenced voices of Indian women from historical and cultural oblivion. This conceptual trajectory, and I guess as a feminist scholar, I'm interested in theory, I'm interested in theory making, and a lot of people come to the Caribbean and they study it, and then they go and they take other people's concepts, and I'm not interested in that kind of work myself. Um, thus, this conceptual theory recognizes a full range of oppressions, resistances, and possibilities initiated by the indentureship experience. It employs and experiments with diverse cultural and imaginative forms. It valorizes women's sexual expression and erotic pleasure, always important, and names and challenges the problems of violence and patriarchal definition of womanhood. It also honors working class, rural, and educated women's leadership, endurance, ingenuity, militancy, and activism, and invests in cross-race, mixed-race, and hybridized women's feminist intimacies and solidarities. In this literature, there's a common celebration of four mothers of Indian labor in the creation of community, landscape, and Indo-Caribbean women's own sense of reliance and womanhood. She has done it differently, and this difference must be celebrated, writes Indo-Guyanese feminist Nisha Hanif in 1999, so 20 years ago, appointing to an emphasis throughout this work on transgressive boundary crossings and agency. This has favored the creation of revised, woman-centered mythologies of interrelatedness and connection. I'm quoting here from Brenda Mehta, um, and something that I think we want to continue to work through in our, in our creation of a, a theoretical terrain. In turn, from within this body of work, feminists have led Caribbean theorization of inclusive feminist models based on doglarization, doglar feminism, and doglar poetics. And in fact, what's really interesting is that the Indo-Caribbean feminist scholarship is the space within which cross-race solidarities and intimacies and Indo-Afro relations and doglar identities <coughs> and so on of various kinds have been the most theorized in the Caribbean, right? And again, this, you know, the creation of a of, of 30 years of scholarship that is not recognized for its intellectual contribution in the region, for me, is um, it's important to mark that kind of marginalization and to, and to challenge it. For example, as I mentioned, Andil Gosain's use of the cutlass as an art object, quote, to join black feminist and Indo-Caribbean feminist thought past and present, as well as to cut, um, as Kanisha Prasad, um, discusses it, she writes, in that spirit, I meditate further on Dogla feminism to argue that the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds have been and continue to be linked 
through labor migrations, plantation economies, and contemporary political and economic crises. In other words, I want to argue that um, from, from the Caribbean and from this scholarship being produced by largely by Indian women, although not <coughs> only, um, meaning that both non-Indian women and Indian men have been also part of the scholarship, you are getting a number of radical intellectual contributions. Um, first, production theory from the ground up, and, and indeed matrilineal. Secondly, a space for theorizing cross-race solidarities and intimacies amongst Indians and Africans, which is largely devoid in other literatures in the region. And um, thirdly, a move across both the Atlantic and Indian oceans to think about what's happening, um, what are the connections in two. And that this has characterized literature for decades. Um, Veronique Braggard extensively documents articulations of cross-race sorority, solidarities, and <coughs> desires in her focus on trans-oceanic dialogues, including the writing of women from post-indentureship sites in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean, such as Lachmi Prasad, Jan Scheinborn, and Ananda Devi. In these women, Indian women's writings, Braggart observes, an imaginary of cross-culturality, uh, Braggart observes an imaginary of cross-culturality, highlighted as the shared experience of oppression of Indians and Africans, regretted is the unspoken rivalry that has pervaded their relationship in many former colonies. And Brenda Mehta's concept of Kalapani hybridity aims further to expand from these two turbulent transatlantic crossings, India and, uh, Indian and African, that highlight a political commonality of experience to include Chinese, Syrian, Lebanese, and other constituencies that do not necessarily, necessarily subscribe to the Dogla aesthetic as a locus of self-identification. In this way, and this is Brenda Mehta's offering in 2004, Kalapani hybridity could offer a solution to the problematics of naming and to the privileging of particular ethnic experiences. And I want to um, show you why that point is, is um, significant to me now. As part of producing transformational Caribbean feminisms, Kalapani poetics comes closest to a trans-oceanic formulation of feminism, right? That is how have these crossings created the basis for multiple kinds of intimacies, solidarities, and relations. However, Meta considers to the, these to be expressions of diasporic dislocations. And I'm going to challenge that notion of reading the Caribbean on diasporic terms, um, as opposed to post-indentureship feminist articulations. So what happened was that there was this book, uh, Indo-Caribbean Feminist Thought. A lot of people thought that we were being racial, um, overly particular, ghettoizing, and, um, and generally stereotypical. And it came from all sides. So some people wanted to know why we were not just being Caribbean. Other people didn't like what we were doing with Indo-Caribbean. It really made nobody happy. But, um, <laughs> not my job. Um, so, however, it was that point made by the younger scholars that stood out to me. The fact that none of them had to go to India, right? The fact that within the Caribbean, enough had been produced, enough had been done by women and men in the Caribbean, right? As a, as a, as a set of matrilineal traditions, and that enough scholarship had begun to be created that they could go to this indentureship and post-indentureship experience for their own theorizing. And for us, that really was a good example of a scholarly tradition that had come into its own and had now provided an originary point of reference for following generations, right? So 30 years of scholarship, it kind of makes sense, except for nobody really acknowledges this. And in the collection, Contributors' concerns with cross-ethnic relations and solidarities also highlighted a core feature of a scholarly tradition that had come into its own within the specificities of post-slavery and post-indentureship realities. So, this for me is important because it meant that those young researchers in this new generation, not mine, but another generation, we're not defining their work by diasporic belonging to India as much as by the odyssey of indenture itself, taking from the activity. And the crossing was therefore a turning point, not just for generations of Indians, but for the societies to which they went to by the tens and hundreds of thousands. 
So I began to think about Indo-Caribbean feminist thought not as Indo-Caribbean feminist thought at all, but instead maybe as post-indentureship feminist thought. In other words, I began to think, as Professor Samberg was talking about yesterday, how has the indentured experience not just been one that allows us to speak about Indians, but allows us to speak about it's the impact of indenture on the entire Caribbean, and for me, particularly on the production of Caribbean feminisms as a whole, right? So I guess you could call it a mainstreaming project, um, or a centering rather than marginal project. So I began to think in terms of post-indentureship feminist thought as a decentering India and diasporic framing, but also as moving away from the kind of racial overdetermination in this particular work. Um, because it's problematic for various reasons, as well as um, the ways in which indentureship went on to shape the entire societies within which it occurred, thus shaping not only Indians and Indo-Caribbean feminisms, but all feminisms itself. And so, If indentureship is a historical moment in the Caribbean, then the production of feminisms that come out of that historical moment cannot not take it into account, right? Just the same way that whatever has come from India with the, the fruits and the flowers that are now part of the domain that have become Caribbean, right? Those things are now implanted in the, the space, which is why you're getting these discourses of cross-racial solidarities, why you're getting these Indian African tensions in which women's bodies and sexualities right, become significant, in which both Indian and African Caribbean feminisms are negotiating. Right? So for me, as I've begun to move towards uh, um, post-indentureship feminist theorizing, so I'll just put the, where we're at in it now. It's a bit wordy, so I thought I'd put it up. Um, you know, nobody says Foucault is wordy. But, um, <laughs> Right, I'm arguing that Caribbean feminisms as a whole, and I'm, this is my argument because of where I sit as an Indo-Caribbean feminist, um, but operating within a larger region. My, I'm arguing that Caribbean feminisms as a whole, particularly in post-indentureship locations, are already also Indians, with that Indian is already different from India. Not because of creolization, but because of indentureship. And this is drawing from Tejaswini Niranjana's um, idea of an East Indian modernity. Um, and, and therefore, I've entirely changed my framework. Whereas a lot of, you'll find a lot of literature, Sheila Rampasad and others, talking about how Indian women have drawn on African women's forms of political organizing, I began to think, is there the same kind of recognition of how African women are drawing on Indo-Caribbean feminist works? And there's a good example in Sam Selvon's Turn Again Tiger, I don't know if you know it, where Ermilla is advising the other women about, um, about resisting, you know? And so this idea that Indian women have something to offer to Caribbean feminism is something that doesn't turn up very often in the literature. So let me just define where I am in this work right now. <coughs> which is thinking about post-indentureship feminisms, my last two slides, thinking about post-indentureship feminisms as feminist consciousness that traces its genealogy through indentureship and post-indentureship experience, dislodges India, um, and calls for the ways that, uh, calls for theorization of the connections between Fiji, Mauritius, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and other places in an understanding of the feminisms that began to be born out of those locations. All right, so the next work that I'm going to be moving into is looking at the production of post-indentureship feminisms across these sites and seeing um, how, what kinds of feminisms become produced out of, um, the, of these kinds of locations and what are their comparisons and solidarities across Atlantic and Oceanic spaces. Um, therefore, we're trying to produce an intellectual tradition that comes out of the specific traditions of post-indentureship and post-slavery societies to offer conceptual terrain um, to both South Asian and Western feminist traditions and to um, include within that the scholarship and creative work that Indian women are doing in order to note the parallels, the different navigational choices, and to establish solidarities. And that currently, 
is the work that I'm doing right now and the work that I will be, the next collection that we will be working on. And so I'm happy to get feedback and suggestions. Thank you.